of programming. The, uh, I want to introduce uh, Rabbi Arthur Waskow, who is our guest speaker tonight. And I have to say it's a great personal pleasure for me to do that, to have him here with us coming from Philadelphia, uh, with us is relatively speaking. Um, uh, Reb Arthur has been a very strong influence on my family, um, bringing us all closer to Ju Judaism and finding the intersection between Judaism and social activism, the places where they most clearly intersect. Um, we'll hear a lot about that tonight and in the two subsequent programs Reb Arthur will be giving in January and March, and they will be on Zoom. Um, as I said, I've known Reb Arthur for a while, since the mid-90s, 1990s, and uh, met and studied with him and other teachers in the Jewish renewal movement. Uh, but even before hearing him, hearing his voice out loud, um, I was given a copy of Seasons of Our Joy, which is a wonderful book that Reb Arthur wrote um, a while ago. And it talks a great deal about the holidays, but it also talks a lot about food and how the two interact. It's a really fun book and had made quite a, uh, made an impact on our family as well. But uh, where Reb Arthur has been a, a source of learning and cultivating his action plans, his greatest impact for me in my memory is his booming voice intoning from Isaiah 58, is this the fast I desire? It, there is nothing like hearing that anyway, but hearing it come from Reb Arthur, my bones rattled. Uh, another occasion that I wanted to share, and, and we spoke just about this a little bit ago, was an opportunity in 1998 when Reb Arthur, Pete Seeger, and the head of one of the Native um, American groups in and around Beacon, New York, uh, we gathered at the side of the shores of uh, the Hudson, where we sang and rallied to promote the healing of the river, which uh, certainly was one of Pete Seeger's great projects. My sons then were 11 and 13, and with their friends, they were greatly moved by what they saw, what they heard, especially from Reb Arthur. Um, an activist since his days in Ann Arbor, uh, Reb Arthur is a strong Jewish voice for justice, especially through the Shalom Center. Do check it out, please. It's Shalom Cent the shalomcenter.org. And that is where Reb Arthur posts weekly Torah commentary and discussions on current political issues, hot button issues especially. And if you haven't already purchased his book, there's still a few copies of this left at our synagogue office. So you will need to and want to go and get it then. So um, enough of me, Reb Arthur, you're on. Uh -huh. uh, it was good of you. I mean, I'm glad you made enough of you. Uh, it was a delight to remember those moments. Yes. Uh, especially the moment of healing the Hudson uh, for Hoshana Rabba, which is about healing. That's right. The That's what it was. Right. So, we were trying uh, to remember. with your permission, I'm going to do a little heresy by beginning the study of Torah with uh, a somewhat different version of the bracha for studying Torah. I believe in the bracha. And uh, uh, when I asked Ariel Lon, a great teacher of Talmud, why he thought the rabbis um, insisted that we should begin study of Torah by insisting that it was a mitzvah. He said, I think they knew that they could get addicted to just studying Torah day and night. They forgot, they knew that they sometimes forgot to uh, give uh, tzedakah. They forgot to daven three times a day. They forgot even to go home and make love to their wives. They were all but three or four of them, uh, uh, just men of thousands. And he said, I think they tried to remind themselves that it was a mitzvah to learn Torah among the mitzvot. It didn't wipe out all the others. Uh, so in that spirit and in the spirit of uh, a uh, wonderful moment, sad and wonderful moment that the Talmud describes. 
um, when a bunch of rabbis were hiding in an attic from the Roman army, uh, they started debating. The reason they were hiding was that Rome had decreed a death sentence for either studying Torah or doing deeds of Torah. So they started debating which was it worth risking your life for? Was it more important to risk your life to study or to do? And finally, uh, Rabbi Kiba broke through the debate by saying, which is greater, study or action? Study if it leads to action. So I hope that what I'm going to be doing tonight, which is looking at the um, deep commitment of Torah to a decent relationship between Adam and Adama, between humanity and earth. You could only get in English Adam and Adama if you said earth and earthling. Uh, but earthling is such a woo-woo word. Uh, but Adam, the normal word for human being in Hebrew, and Adama, the word for earth and human being, they show the connection in the words, which is true of the reality. It drives me nuts to have to use the word environment in English. Well, environment means, oh, it's out there somewhere, somewhere in the environs. But Adam Adama teaches the truth. We are interlinked. So, so in the bracha I use, I'm going to be drawing on something that happened to me um, must have been 40 years after my grandmother taught me Hebrew, getting ready to become a bar mitzvah. We learned bab, ba, be, and we learned words. Uh, we learned sentences, and then we came to a sentence with uh, the word in it that was spelled yud, hey, wov, hey. And she said, that's how the nine. And I said, Grandma, you just told me a dollar. There's no dollar. You just told me a nun. There's no nun. Can't be. She said, I know. Just do it. So for 40 years, I just did it. And then in a moment to, the story is too long to explain. I found myself asking what would happen if I tried pronouncing the yud, hey, and wo, hey, uh, without any vowels. It's not Yahweh, it's not Yehovah. They have vowels, there's no vowels. So I tried. And what happened for me was, a breath, and I thought, that makes sense. At least one of the real names of the real God, Echad, one, should be in every language, not only in Hebrew, but in Hebrew and Egyptian and Chinese and Russian and English and Greek and Latin in all of them. And the only sound that's in every language is just the sound of breathing. So I began to think of that extraordinary name of God as the breath of life, not Lord, not King. And so the bracha became for me a blessing of Yah as a substitute for just breathing. Yah as in hallelujah. In English, hallelujah, everybody thinks it's one word. It's two words, right? Hallelujah. Let us praise, I would say, the breath of life. And then ruach instead of melech. Ruach, the spirit, the breath, the wind, every once in a while becomes the hurricane. So, with apologies to my grandmother, 
and 2,000 years worth of rabbis. Baruch Atah. Yeah. Eloheinu Ruach HaOlam. Asher Kichanu B'Mesvot. V'Sivanu La'asok. V'Divre Torah. And I welcome you to say Amen. So what I want to do tonight is look at several major stories and practices of Torah, which all focus on the relationship of human beings with the earth. We were, after all, what nowadays people call an indigenous people. We were shepherds and farmers. And the relationship with earth was the most important way of making a sacred relationship with God. That's why uh, there's a code of kosher food. Because if what comes from the earth that's most important is food, then you have to do it in a sacred way. Uh, and in our mid 70s, actually, Reb Zalman and Shachter Shalom, he said, well, that worked when we were shepherds and farmers, but now we eat, you might say, energy, and we take it from the same earth uh, in coal and oil and gas. And we were beginning, even in the mid 70s, to take some of it from sun and wind and the tides. So he said, if there was a kosher code for food, there needs to be a kosher code for energy. And when he said that, he found many people said, kosher applies to food, doesn't apply to energy, doesn't compute. He said, all right, so call it eco-kosher. Uh, is it eco-kosher to eat energy from a nuclear power plant? Depending on the circumstances, maybe, and maybe not. Uh, maybe some energy is strafe. Um, so that's a whole um, way of thinking about our relationship with Earth, which we've been forced to begin exploring in our generation because the way we've been behaving toward Earth is shattering earth and therefore shattering ourselves. So I want to go back to some of the stories which I think exemplify the love affair of the Jewish people with the earth. Uh, I'll even say one line. I think that all our festivals uh, are the children of that love affair between the Jewish people and the earth. Uh, they got overlaid with historical meaning and political meaning and spiritual meaning. In their deepest, they were historical and political and spiritual and earthy. The earth, the moon, and the sun in their dance with each other uh, created, you might even say procreated, those festivals. And I think we need to use them again uh, to celebrate the reasons of our hopeful joy. So let me go back to the first of the stories about human beings and the earth. I think the story of the Garden of Eden is the first. It's a parable of warning. Uh, parable of what's mm, to be careful about not doing. I think it probably came from shepherds who learn what it meant to uh, bring food from the earth. So the way I hear the story of the Garden of Eden is this. The voice uh, speaking on behalf of reality says, there is wonderful abundance here. Eat of it. 
take joy in it. Just don't gobble up everything. There's one tree just to make clear that you don't want to gobble up everything. Don't eat from that one tree. But the human race in that story, that warning parable, didn't um, absorb the lesson and did eat from that tree and did gobble up everything in sight. It's the story of what happened in the Gulf of Mexico just 10 years ago, uh, where BP oil um, gobbled up everything in sight, uh, had no self-restraint, which is what the voice in Eden was saying you needed to have some self-restraint, plunged two miles deep into the waters of the Gulf, and by doing that, killed 11 of their own workers and a big hunk of the life of the Gulf of Mexico over the next month before the oil outburst could be stopped. So I think that's, I would never call it the original sin, but I think it is a, a sin that humanity keeps repeating. And at last we've reached the point with the whole round globe, not only a thin sliver of land on the Eastern Mediterranean shore uh, at stake. And we are, hmm, we know now how to live with earth, but we don't act yet as if we believe that we have to live with Earth. But I believe the story of the Garden of Eden is trying to teach us that. And I imagine that farmers who got to know that, they got to know that if you uh, tried to gobble up everything, there wouldn't be anything because the end of the story of the Garden of Eden is the, vanish, the, the abundance just vanished. Uh, the earth is only going to produce thorns and thistles, and human beings are going to have to work with the sweat pouring down their faces every day, emphasizes every day of the week, just in order to have enough food to eat. If we have time, I'd like to come back. I think there's something interesting in how the human race makes the mistake uh, and what the implications are of that mistake. So now let me leap. We see the worst example of what the concentration of uh, deadly power can do to human beings and the earth in the story of Pharaoh. He tries to commit genocide, killing all the boy children. He can't get away with it. There's a nonviolent resistance movement from the midwives uh, and from his own daughter. Uh, he, uh, uh, when he is called in the name of the breath of life, I sort of imagine the conversation between Moshe and Aaron and Miriam and the Pharaoh uh, Moshe has learned and taught, I think, Aaron and Miriam, uh, the notion that this new name of God uh, is the breath of life. And Pharaoh, when they say, let my people go, we just want to go three days into the wilderness and do a prayer service. He says, says who? And they say, the breath of life. And he says, what kind of a God is that? The Nile River is a God. I am a God. Oh, the breath of life? What are you talking? Yeah, just can't even pronounce it. It's just breathing. Silly. Uh, so we know when that happens already, who's going to win this uh, argument. So 
he not only enslaves human beings, <coughs> Pharaoh does, but his stubbornness and his cruelty and his refusal to free a bunch of his people uh, brings the disaster on the earth. It gets out of whack. There were always locusts, but never locusts that ate up the whole crop. There were always occasional thunderstorms, but the worst hailstorm in the history of Egypt and all the other plagues. And I think it's teaching us, the story is teaching us that the oppression of human beings and the oppression of the earth which then ends up damaging human beings, it's connected. It's, and we see today that governments that are willing to oppress human beings are governments that are also willing to damage, wound, maybe even kill the earth. So the first thing that happens after liberation from Pharaoh and his plagues, on the other side of the Red Sea, the people say, what are we gonna eat out here? And some of them grumble, oh, slavery was terrible, but there were after all onions and garlic and meat, uh, but what are we gonna eat out here in the wilderness? And the breath of life says, huh, okay. The universe is still abundant. And this business of you're gonna have to work every day of your life, really hard labor, to get just barely enough to eat, you know, doesn't have to be true. Let me offer you this stuff. And the people didn't know what to call it. They called it manhu, what's that? Mana is just, it's, it's not a translation. It's just the same sound in English. The guys who wrote the King James Version of the Bible didn't bother translating it. What were they going to say? Uh, the, all the people, all the people uh, ate. What's that? They, but that's what the Hebrew says. Manu, what is it anyway? It came to feed them. The earth was abundant. And there was a way of self-restraint. But the way of self-restraint was Shabbat. And the way of self-restraint was, if you took too much every morning, it rotted and stank, and you couldn't eat it. Mm -hmm. People learn. The people learn to be self-restrained in a way that didn't mean a kind of ascetic self-denial, but a way that was joyful. Shabbat was joyful. Uh, it was self-restraint that was joyful. And the story, I think, again, a parable of mana and Shabbat come together. Then the people, either from the parable, they decided to make a law or from the practice, they made a parable, one way or the other. They came up with the notion that every seventh year, the earth would get to rest for a whole year, not just for a day, once a week, but for a whole year, a year of Shabbat, Shabbaton, of Shabbat to the uh, power of Shabbat. Um, and we are today, right now, in the midst of what we call a Shemitah year, a year of release. Shemitah means release. So it has two names, Shabbat Shabbaton and Shemitah, release. And that meant that they learned, and again, it seems to me it was farmers who taught them, uh, they learned that they had to let the earth alone for some period of time. It would give more food, not less. The Torah even has, it has a, a verse where 
somebody, I figure he was like a Harvard MBA, uh, the voice of a Harvard MBA in, in the Torah says, hey, what are we going to eat? We can't grow anything in the seventh year. Stuff might grow by itself and we're allowed to eat it, but we can't do agriculture. And the, the voice of Torah said, cool it. It's okay. There will be even more blessing if you don't have organized agriculture in the seventh year. And some people think that's faith. I think it's faith and science together. They knew that if they tried farming over and over and over and over and over again, all the same land, it was going to give up and couldn't produce. And in fact, chapter 26 of Leviticus, chapter 25, describes the seventh year. Chapter 26 says, and what happens if you won't let the earth rest? Hmm. Chapter 26 says, the earth rests anyway. It rests on your head. It rests by famine. It rests by fire and flood and exile, what we would call mass refugees. Uh, uh, the earth gets to rest. It takes its Shabbat regardless. If you read chapter 26, it sounds to me like a climate scientist talking about what happens if we don't minimize the CO2 and methane that we're pouring into the atmosphere, uh, choking the breath of life when we do it. So that's what they worked out as a way of trying to protect the earth, heal the earth, and still be able to use the earth in a life-giving way. The last thing I want to say is I think there's one vision in the whole Tanakh, the whole Hebrew Bible, there is one vision of what would happen, what would it be like if we could really work it out all in a peaceful relationship between human beings and earth. And I think that text is the Song of Songs. The Song of Songs, I think, is the Garden of Eden for grown-ups, the Garden of Eden for a grown-up human race. And I think the Torah is begging, urging, yearning, imploring the human race to grow up enough to be able to treat the earth decently. That leaves a big question. In our generation, a generation of industry, a generation of coal and oil and unnatural gas. What does it mean? What does Shemitah mean? What does it mean for us to heal Earth and have a peaceful relationship with Earth? So that's where I want to stop and what I uh, talked with you all uh, the organizers of this beforehand, was that when I stopped, we could have maybe 15 minutes of what I've started calling um, breakthrough groups, not breakout groups, the breakthrough groups. It was there three or four people in each group, and you all get a chance to talk and to argue or to debate, debate, better word and better tone than argue with each other about what I've said, does it make sense? What would make sense to do it now uh, like that? So if whoever is managing the technology here, we call them the Levites, just like the Levites operated the machinery that made it possible to do the offerings in the temple. Uh, so if you're Levites can operate the technology so their breakout, breakthrough groups of three or four people each, and we can come back in 15 minutes. That would be great. Okay.
Here we go. So it looks like Rabbi, Rabbi Spitzer's joined this one or just looking in on it. Oh, yeah, right. I just thought I would join. Excellent. Good. Welcome. Well, let's see. Denise hasn't oh. unmuted, I think. Let's see. All right. But in any event, um, yeah, the, uh, the um, looking at the Shabbat expanding into the Shemitah and uh, makes a lot of sense. Well, what would you think of as a way of doing for our society, which is obviously very different from theirs, uh, what they had in mind? How would you say, what would you say we should be doing in order to live peacefully and fruitfully, you might literally say fruitfully, mm. with the earth? That's a tough one. <laughs> it is. That is a that is a tough one. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's like part of it is recognizing part of the shemitah is is the issue of well, it doesn't belong to us. You know, it, it doesn't belong to us. Right. Um, we're taking care of it. That's we're just supposed to take care of it but it doesn't belong to us. And I think that's more of the indigenous people's view of the land. I mean, you know, when we, when the Europeans came to the, to the North America and said, oh yeah, we'll give, we'll give you, you know, this or that or the other thing for, we'll buy your, your land. They weren't selling their land. They were just, you know, letting, letting them have hunting, hunting rights on the land. And, you know, they could grow stuff, but it didn't belong to them. It didn't belong to anybody. So they could sign all the. Um, and, oh, rabbis joined us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we were just talking about the, the Thursday nights. Uh, um, Martha was uh, uh, had gotten used to the uh, uh, the Burke lectures, and so she's out in the yeah. parking lot. <laughs> yes, I I apologize for that not being clear. <laughs> <laughs> so we had started also to, to talk about um, the, the idea of the breath of uh, uh, God's name being the breath of life, which is very, very um, intriguing. I had uh, not not seen seen or heard that uh, concept before. Yeah, I usually think about the unpronounceable personal name of God. I love that it's a non-existent form of the verb to be. That is to say, it's got the same root as all the words that are in the, the verb to be. Um, like haya, hey yud hey, means was. And hove, hey vav vav hey, means is. And Yihye, yud he, yud he means will be. E. Yud he, vav he has all of those letters, but it's a non existent form. So you can say, oh, does God exist? Well, God's name is a non existent form mm. of the verb that means to exist or to be. And, <laughs> and so I think there's something very like, meaningful about that. You might say that God's name is is, was, will be, or God, God describes God's self as, hey, yeah, I share, hey, yeah, I will be what I will be. And like God in process, God continuing to always form and change. Another way to sort of say it would be God as eternity. But I actually think that like eternity, that which is, was, will be, is very similar to describing God as the breath of life because what is eternal, what is, uh, what connects 
between all cultures, all nations, is the breath that we breathe, what connects us with all other living creatures, what connects us to the, like, to the earth is, is the breath. And then you can say it's onomatopoeic, like, which is what he said. That is to say, like, when you just, when you just say those letters, it sounds like a breath, like this whole Jehovah thing, like that King James did, like it is, first of all, like the Yud isn't actually pronounced as a J in Hebrew. And the hey, uh, like, it's not like it, I think it is supposed to be like pronounced sort of flowing way. Um, I was also thinking as you were going over the verb forms, uh, I thought, God the unknowable. Yeah, so God the ineffable, God the unknowable, that's another, that's definitely another way of thinking about it. The non, yeah. Unable to be pronounced, unable to be uttered. Um, I, so I definitely think that that's there too. One of the things that I really love about our tradition is how sort of multifaceted, like even just God's name, God's personal name, is right and then how do we refer to god like adonai means lord hashem just means the name mm -hmm. like, like oh, that's right so, right i do i do think like the terms that we use are so like carefully constructed as to create this possibility for different connection different ways of connection mm -hmm. yeah, very powerful all right, I'm going to pop in on another group. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks for stopping by. Yes. <laughs> Here comes Rabbi. Okay. Hi, Hi, Rabbi. Hi. Kathleen Duff, St. Helens. I'm glad you're here. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the warm welcome and allowing me to um, pray with you. Absolutely. So, so we were, go ahead. How's the conversation going? Um, you know, I, I thought that there were, uh, that my big takeaway, and Edith, you can um, jump in anytime you want, but Edith was saying that, you know, she didn't grow up in this area. She grew up in the Midwest and the idea that um, the earth rests, the land rests, um, was something that she was brought up with, but she can't imagine an entire country doing that. And I thought, you know, she's absolutely, you know, right about that. I can't imagine our entire country doing that. However, I hear something very different in that. What would happen if we took care of the land for that for an entire year, if we stopped polluting and, um, uh, you know, that that would also be allowing the land to grow and, uh, and prosper, so. Yeah, I think sort of what I hear behind that sort of question is this like perennial question in Judaism about universalism versus particularism and mm -hmm. sort of Judaism, there's sort of a piece of it where like in order to fully be Shabbat observant, in order to fully be committed to Jewish particularism, to be like a member of the Jewish community and practicing in a particular kind of way, it actually implies that there are folks in the world who aren't like the world keeps going, but Shabbat, like Shabbat is for, mm -hmm. for like, that is to say, one of the greatest gifts that the Jewish people and the Hebrew Bible have given to the world is the idea of weekend, that you don't have to work all the time, that resting is also a part of life, that it that you can be more productive with rest than without rest. Mm. And um, 
and yet like there is like a piece of observant Judaism that um, requires uh, that there be people who are working on Shabbat, like maybe they have a different Sabbath. And so it's sort of more like a crop rotation kind of idea of Shemitah where some, some of the land lies fallow each year, but some of the land is worked each year <laughs> as opposed to uh, as opposed to all of it lying fallow all at once. Mm. Because mm. what would we do if everything actually stopped? <laughs> yeah. 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 I can um, remember, um, it probably was about eight years ago, Bonnie, I had a significant number of um, people in my family um, die and um, Bonnie Kramer's good friend and neighbor. And she came to my house one day and she brought me Shabbat candles. And she said, you need to rest from the grief. Um, and she said, I don't care when you light them, but for 24 hours, just rest. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Very wise. Mm -hmm rest from that grief not don't grieve and don't do what you need to do to be whole and be okay again but you've had a lot of grief a lot of sadness and yeah have a shabbat so edith was there anything else that we spoke about that uh not really in in our 40s five seconds that we have left in here. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for letting me drop in. You're welcome. I also like the idea of um, don't eat everything. Leave something for somebody else. Um, imagine what our, you know, if we thought not only beyond our community and our nation, but if we thought about glo globally feeding people, leaving something for somebody else, don't eat it all, don't take it all. You know, the gluttony. I I'm trying to. <laughs> getting back into business here yeah we're back in plenary again oh, okay all right so what comments questions thoughts appeared or appear now Reb Arthur yeah Barbie Harris speaking I um mentioned in my group that I had never heard of the explanation of mana and wondered if anyone else had heard how you explained it. And they said, no, I absolutely loved it. What you said made so much sense for the first that's time. It. That's what it says, right? In the, in the Holy book. And it was <laughs> called mana because they said man who, what is it? Uh, what is it? <laughs> I didn't uh -huh. pick it up, sorry. I don't interpret things well, but I did not pick that up, but it was put in my face and I loved it. Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes uh, things are hidden in plain sight. <laughs> right. I had remembered uh, hearing about the Aleph, uh, a, an instructor uh, out west talking about the Aleph as the, the breath of God, so I was kind of remembering back to that you were describing, right? And the, the unknowable God, the the unknowable. Because the olive is not pronounced, but yet it's there, and uh, uh, that's that's why I think the rule is you're not not that you're not allowed to pronounce. The Urevave is that there's no way to pronounce it. We don't think breathing is pronouncing. 
Uh, mm. in some ways, breathing we think is the opposite of pronouncing. So uh, we even think that when people are silent and breathing, they're silent, but it's not really true. They make a soft, they make, <laughs> they make what Elijah thought was a, a small voice, uh, a still small voice. Mm -hmm. Breathe, you're still making yeah. a Call voice. Mama so, yeah. 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 I, I, uh, well, I appreciated what you said at, uh, about the taking each of the Chagim or the holidays and looking for a theme that applies to uh, taking care of the earth rather than attacking it. And uh, I think that, that's, that's, that could, that's a seed that could grow. Hmm. In the small group that I ended up in, I pointed out I told a little story. It's a funny story and it's a serious story. I was sitting in my backyard thinking about the holidays and I said out loud, I wish there was a holiday, a Jewish holiday for conserving energy. Whereupon mm -hmm. it felt like, I don't think this actually happened, but it felt like all the trees yelled at me, saying, <laughs> there is one, it's called Hanukkah. And it's all about uh, how one day's worth of oil met the needs of eight days. That's mm. energy conservation. <laughs> so so I, that's something we have to, to pass out, uh, spread. Right. So I was thinking, what if we said in all the synagogues, we said, okay, we can do energy audits of our homes, our synagogues, other Jewish buildings. We can see what energy we're wasting and what energy we can conserve. Uh, and we'll make that a time to find out and then to do it. Uh, it'll probably take longer than Hanukkah to do it, but we can find out at least what the story is. Um, there are now a lot of electric utilities will actually come out and send somebody out and do an audit of your energy use. And tell you when you're wasting it, when the windows, you know, let the cold air in and all that. So Kanika would be a wonderful time to focus on that, um, to tell the ancient story and to say, you know what? Uh, it doesn't have to be a miracle. It can be what we do. That's I love it. Now, what about on Shabbos when some people don't continue driving their car, they don't turn the lights uh, or the oven and things? Well, I think one of the points of Shabbos, it did come with the mana, and it was about... Um, letting the earth be fruitful without forcing it into overwork. Uh, so I think the origins of Shabbat had something in it about that. Uh, Heschel's book, The Sabbath, has a whole page about uh, Shabbos from a, uh, an, I'll use the word environment, even though I don't like it, from an environmental uh, standpoint, from an earthy standpoint. Um, so uh, I celebrate not using the car uh, or if there's no other way to get to shul, using it to carpool. So you're not using four cars or three cars to get people to shul, but using one. Uh, again, conserving the energy. Uh, thinking about bicycling, encouraging people. I'm a little too old to bicycle, but uh, thinking about using bikes to get places, uh, expanding on, on what we've learned from from treating Shabbat seriously that way. What we learned from other days, four other days of the week. 
you know, one of the things I think about when we talk about, about Shabbat being an energy conservation day in, in the way it's, we're describing it, it's by, def by default, not necessarily thinking about it being the day that we are using it, that we're using it to, to conserve energy. Um, I, I've been reading with some reluctance because I don't like uh, 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 Noah Yuval, um, I guess I forgot his last name, the fellow who wrote Sapiens. Um, oh, yeah. I can't remember his name all of a sudden, but uh, Harari. Harari. Yes. Harari. Harari. You know, he's, he's basically positing that as, as we, from where I've been reading, positing how we are, um, as, as we get more and more technological and more and more sophisticated, we become less and less um, real humans and are destroying the earth as a result. And uh, I'm not disagreeing with that, but his, his uh, manner about it is sometimes difficult for me to take. But um, the, the, the fact of the matter is we, did, we have the rules about Shabbat so that we don't have to work. And all of these labor-saving devices now have taken us over so that um, when it's not Shabbat, we don't have to work anyway because, you know, the heat goes on by itself. I don't have to go out and chop wood to, to do that. Um, so it's kind of this reversal of purpose. And if there's a way we could rethink that, I think that might be... I mean, it has to be done on an individual basis. I can't see it becoming a larger thing. But I think that would be really cool if we look at it totally the opposite. Hmm. Oh, about it being universal. In America, there used to be uh, rules about Sunday, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The uh, Stores closed, et cetera, et cetera. So that was a problem for Jews, and it would be a problem now for Muslims. But what if the rule were one day a week? Uh, you choose the day, but every family chooses the day in which they're not going to uh, buy, they're not going to sell, they're not going to use the automobile, they're not etc. They're going to minimize the use of light in the house, uh, etc. What if, what if we got to choose which day was our Shabbat uh, and people could choose Sunday or Saturday or Friday or any day, but a commitment that one seventh of the time we were going to uh, minimize the use of energy. Uh, so that would, that would be one way of of doing it, and so that's the kind of question. That would be a great family activity to come up with that plan, <laughs> especially having kids. I mean, if you have right. kids come up, come, come into the discussion and come in with, with decisions or opinions. Right. Great. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay. Are there thoughts from people who are um, chewing over these ideas? I think maybe that's why the only animals we could eat were what's called ruminant animals, that is, they have two stomachs and chew over their food. We're supposed to learn from them to chew things over a couple of times. Hmm? I'm not quite sure I, I heard that, that well, we should have two the stomachs. Kosher, the kosher animals that we're supposed to eat Mm -hmm. um, have two stomachs, right? The, the cud, chewing the cud. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm just saying maybe that's to teach us that ideas we should chew over and think 
and mm. says running off with an idea right away. Uh, mm. She chewed right. ideas, and uh, yeah, the mic goes with the, the old idea: if you eat, uh, you eat a particular animal, you gain the qualities of that animal, right? Right. right. Uh, another indigenous idea. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> well, if we paid attention, if we said, we would have to say to our kids, well, we're eating animals that learn to chew over their food, so let's try to learn it. Uh, we also eat animals that don't eat animals. It's a kind of um, vicarious, vicarious vegetarianism. Mm. Well, chickens eat worms. <laughs> True. <laughs> so they don't quite fit into that paradigm. Right. But one thought about that they chew and re-chew their food is that we have to use and reuse what we can use. Right. Of other, right, other it's things not, in life. It's not only ideas. You're absolutely right. Hmm. Hmm. I, I'm going to want in one of these next two sessions to talk some more about what I said about. The yud hey vav the death of life. But let me raise that. Some, uh, how did people feel about that? Were you shocked at my doing that with the uh, bracha, with the the blessing for Torah study, or were you shocked and intrigued, or were, you know how did how did people feel about that? I spent a lot of time at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, so very little theologically shocks me. <laughs> right. <laughs> hmm. Well, having been involved with renewal for many years, it's, it's daily commonplace. Thank yeah. you. And in fact, there are times people will look like in the Shema, you're going, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I get a chance to explain, mostly not. But no. no, that makes it for me far more yeah. personal, relevant. More, um, more meaningful and, more, and meaningful. more connected to the way things really are. One of the lines in our uh, Chavez morning, um, Sidor goes, uh, I'm using the chant that Joey, I, why, Joey Weisenberg brought to that line. Nishma kolchai, tivarechet shimcha, ya. Yeah, hello, Hainu, Nishma Kohai, Tivarecha Chimpa, Yah, hello, Hainu, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The, let me think. The breath of all life praises your name for your name itself whispers all life. Uh, Nishmat Kochai means the breath of all life, praises your name. Notice it's not Kivarechacha, which praises you, praises your name. And then, uh, so I 
That was the third thing that happened to me when I tried breathing the name. And the third thing said to me, oh, there was somebody who realized this and put it, his friends all said, oh, you, it's so exciting and you've got to put it in the Sador so I'll never forget it. And then the easiest thing to do with something uh, in the Sador is to forget what it means and just chant it. But it seems to me that line is saying the breath of all life praises God's name because it is God's name. Because the Yudhe Vavhe is the breath of all life. And uh, when we say the Shema, uh, when we say, yeah, and then say it's one, it's one. It's because the breath of all life is one. You and I are breathing right now the breath from an oak tree, uh, an azalea bush, uh, a rabbit. Uh, it all gets mixed together. And it's the breath of all life that we breathe in order to breathe, in order to talk. Uh, so, so it seems to me a profound insight. And we know now that the exchange of CO2 and oxygen mm -hmm. is what keeps all life on the planet going. And right now, we've invented ways of pouring so much CO2 into the atmosphere that every plant on Earth can't turn. There aren't enough plants turning with CO2 back into oxygen. And therefore, the planet gets hotter and hotter and hotter. I refuse to call it global warming. Warming is so nice. I call it global scorching. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I I begin to think that what we call the climate crisis is a crisis in God's name. It's a mm -hmm. crisis in the Yudhe Vafe. The breathing is choked. I mean, I can't breathe is like the planet, Earth. Yeah. Yeah, I can't breathe. George, so, George Floyd, yeah. So, so I, I really want to lift that up, and that's one of the reasons I care about changing the words in the bracha to lift it up so people are conscious of it. I think that's very, very clear that we need to do that, each one of us, and as a community keeping that, that consciousness, that breathing consciousness, besides all the other good effects that it would have, uh, physiologically, mentally, right. spiritually. Hmm. When the rabbi chanted the second paragraph of the Shema, I remember a moment Back in 1971, I was invited, was still living in Washington, D.C. I had written The Freedom Seder in 1969, and I was a newbie. I mean, I, except for the Pesach Seder, I was totally uninterested in Jewish life, Jewish underlying life. Uh, if somebody had told me that I was going to choose to become a rabbi, I would have you know, come on, why would I do that? Uh, but something happened to me, actually it happened in the week after Dr. Martin Luther King was murdered. Uh, a week later came Pesach. And at Pesach time, Lyndon Johnson, President Johnson sent the army to occupy the city of Washington, which is where I was living, um, because there was an uprising. Uh, from the black community after King was killed. Uh, and the troops were there for weeks. And Pesach came a week after King was killed. In fact, I learned later, years later. Oh, God. He was supposed to spend his first Seder at the home of the Heschels. Hmm. In 19... 
in 1968. I can't even say it without crying. So I walked home to get ready to do the Seder past the army. And the machine gun on a Jeep pointing at the block I lived on in Washington. And my Kishkas began saying, this is Pharaoh's army. You're going home to celebrate Passover It's Pharaoh's army. And the Seder became, it was always serious for me. I grew up, my father and mother were, uh, my father helped found the Baltimore Teachers Union when teachers were treated really terribly and changed the way they were treated. And the two of them uh, actually did registration uh, drives with uh, black citizens of Baltimore. Um, uh, so the Seder was serious for me. It was about freedom and it was about justice. But serious, that night it was like a volcano. It wasn't just serious. Uh, uh, and it felt like the Seder was in the streets. And then we came to the line, which I had read every place off since I was old enough to read. It says, in every generation, every human being, and it doesn't say every Jew, it says call Adam, every human, is obligated to act as if we come forth from slavery to freedom, not our great, 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 great grandfathers and mothers only, but we. And I had read that, but it didn't mean much. And that night it meant something, but the streets were full of the Seder, the Seder was on the streets. Um, so I ended up writing what became the Freedom Seder, um, celebrating the long struggle of American Blacks, as well as American Jews for freedom. Um, and, um, and that's what started my journey into becoming a rabbi. Uh, and it was the union of reality with the page of the book uh, that did that for me. And I guess I've felt ever since that making the reality of the world and the pages of the book come together is what really matters certainly mattered to me. And it turned out it mattered to a lot of people. I mean, one thing I never would have imagined if you'd asked me about the Freedom Seder in 1969, I never would have imagined that there'd be hundreds of thousands of people who would write their own Seder and write their own Haggadah. Uh, there'd be feminist Haggadahs and uh, vegetarian Haggadahs, the uh, Haggadah of the Liberated Lamb, I remember. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> anti-war Haggadahs, and um, just amazing. I never, never, never even imagined that. And it happened because people said, oh, you mean we can make the ancient memory into a present reality? That's why it happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hmm. No. Rev. Arthur. Yes. I listened to a podcast, the uh, Judaism Unbound podcast, a couple weeks ago. They were doing a review of a new book about Mayor Kahana that uh, uh, that that describes that uh, you and 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 Mayor uh, were two sides to the same coin. <laughs> Uh, and I was just wondering, you know, do you see that same kind of connection between your radicalism and Mayor Khanna's radicalism? And in, in you know, what, what, what do you think about that? Uh, I, I say this, I say this as a person who is 31. I, I didn't live through the 60s. I, 
you know, I interact with the things that you're discussing as a student of history and not as a lived part of my experience. Uh, Mayor Kahana was off the scene before, almost before I was born. Um, and, and here you are still teaching, still spreading your Torah. Um, it's, you know, and, and, and I just, I wonder, you know, in what ways did Kahana get it right? In what ways did you get it wrong? In what ways are, you know, what do you think? <laughs> well, for my 88th birthday a month ago, I got arrested in a faith-based demonstration in Washington, D.C. about climate, wearing a talus, uh, chanting Hebrew and English songs. <clears throat> um, so I think, I think the one thing Kahani was right about was there was richness and power in Torah. I think he got totally wrong about that richness and power being to elevate the Jewish people above other people's. Um, totally wrong. And the result was, I mean, one of his plots was to uh, uh, interfere with bringing the, I think it was the Bolshoi Theater from Russia to the United States. And they bombed an office and killed a Jewish woman. That's what Torah is supposed to do. Um, they, sure, you can make any community into, uh, into the heart of a fascist uh, policy. Uh, any community. I have, I have a kind of, uh, story in my head about people saying to me, but religion, it just gets people angry and hostile and sometimes violent. So that's true, sometimes it does. And I've asked myself why. So I think, here's the little story. I think it goes something like this. Some wise person or group of people gets it that there is the one that all is deeply united. And they create a bunch of rituals and practices and symbols and holidays, all intended to celebrate and teach their kids and their grandkids and their great grandkids that all is one. And it worked fine until they meet another bunch of people who claim that they are also celebrating the one, but they have a totally different set of symbols and holidays and practices and all that, right? So there are two things you can do with that. One thing is to say, you guys, not only are you mistaken, you're lying. Because we know how to get to the one and you're pretending you get there another way. And it must be a lie. So you're disgusting. And we're going to smash you. Or you could say, oh, wow. The one is infinite. And of course, like the rainbow coming from white light. There are many, many ways of approaching the one. And we are interested in learning how you do it. Uh, we're interested in teaching you how we do it. And some of the ideas we might even borrow and some of them you might even borrow. But even if we didn't borrow them, they are it's such an excitement to realize how glorious the one is. 
that it can be refracted in so many different ways. So there are two ways of responding to that discovery. And one of them leads to disaster. And the other one leads to, uh, to human connection. Um, so I think, so I only, I only think that Kahani got right that there was power and energy in Torah. But what the power and energy for, what it was for, that I think he got totally wrong. And how to use it. Yeah. Well, once you get that is for domination, then you're bound to use it wrong. So, so thank you. The question. I, what do you think of my answer? What do you feel about it? That's where I should have started. First of all, what do you feel about it? Every question should be really to ourselves, mm. not, to, not to the guy who had, you know, who you all invited. But every question really does come from ourselves. So we should right. ask it ourselves. So, I'm sorry, who was it who asked? That oh, was me. I, 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 uh, I very much appreciate uh, your answer. And, and, I, and I, I, really, I really appreciate the good humor with which you took the question because I was a little worried about it. <laughs> um, I was... I admit to have been completely captivated by the by the comparison um, because there is so much power and um, strength in a Jewish particularism in the Jewish community, in Torah, in the way that we choose to interact with the world. And that strength can be used in sort of positive ways and not, and not as positive ways. Um, but the but the strength of conviction is like extremely powerful. I've been working my way through your book. I, uh, I, haven't, I haven't read the whole thing, um, uh, but I, I, I've, I've been enjoying it. And I, I will say that I, I do think that I in, inhabit a world that was very different, changed by the world that you inhabit. And, and so there are ways in which the book speaks to me as a human being, and there are ways in which the book misses me a little bit on like, certain generational differences. And, you know, it isn't like you ha you had like this tremendous experience and i grew up sort of taking the fact that you could have uh, a seder that uh, incorporated themes 
incorporated the theme of liberation in so many different ways, you know, for granted, because that's what we that's what we did. We did in part, you know, based on your teachings and and uh, and others who learned from you and with you and who innovated the same thing at the same time. And just very powerfully, the world has shifted. Um, Yeah, I mean, I struggle a little bit with the idea that rabbinic Judaism is over. I sort of, I want to know a little bit more about what what we mean by that, for saying that. Um, I, I sort of feel like very attached to that. Maybe I'm attached to it in a kind of conventional kind of way that needs more probing and exploration and maybe it's a little bit of an idol I don't know um so you know I I uh very grateful for the opportunity to engage and to think well I'm very grateful for your asking the question and I'm even more grateful for your beginning to give your own answer. I would be fascinated, I mean this, I would love you to write me, awasco at the shalomcenter.org. You gotta put that the in there, awasco at the, T-H-E, shalomcenter.org. I'd be, I'd be really grateful for your writing me how, at, or being at the next two sessions, but writing me, easier to get it directly. Uh, how your generation does see the differences, what in your generational experience uh, uh, says X, Y, or Z. I don't know what, but I, that's what I want to know. I mean, I would be hungry to know <laughs> uh, what, yeah. what, uh, what it is. I yeah. like the idea I like the idea of Judaism um, standing in a long line of tradition. Um, so for me, uh, I don't really look back and say, well, Second Temple Judaism, it's over, and da da da, goodbye, rabbinic Judaism, I'm moving on, and now I am something apart from you i am post x y and z there's none of that to me in in judaism there is none of that it's all incorporating everything i am is everything that we have been and what history has brought to this very day and hour but not apart from or ever uh, losing everything that stood before me. The way I deal with what might at first seem like a paradox of past and future is to think of Judaism as a spiral. In a spiral, you're always going sort of back in order to go forward. You never not go back and you never get stuck in back. I mean, that's what Midrash is. Um, and I think that's one of the things that Chavez was about, was saying, so you've absorbed the week behind you and now take a deep breath, uh, look at the Torah that's connected with the week you're in and learn so that next year, when you read that Torah again, it's gonna be different because you are different and the world is different. Um, and uh, whoever wrote, uh, turn it and turn it like a jewel because every facet, every face is in it. Uh, keep turning it because you'll find a new facet. So it, it's the whole thing is still there, but there are new facets and the old teaching is still there. And there's a wonderful 
And uh, uh, partial we read just a few weeks ago, uh, uh, in fact, it, it's in two different parts. There's what I think is the first clear, explicit midrash inside the Torah. And before the flood, God says, these people, they are, they are hooked on evil from the get-go. I'm going to wipe them out. After the flood, God says, these people, they are hooked on evil and they endanger the earth. I can't wipe them out. And I think like a good Midrash, it quotes the old text and then it comes somewhere new. And what has happened? I mean, there are billions of dead. Talk about a Holocaust. There are billions of dead human beings and animals and birds and whatever, all. And uh, the one, the breath of life, the one, whatever you, whoever, whatever you think, the one is, sees it all and says, push, even if they are bent on evil, I can't wipe them out. I can't do that again. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's right there. And that's why I think it's the first Midrash, God's own Midrash. Uh, and uh, that's what I think is the life-giving force. And absolutely don't dump any of it. I've debated, you know, there are pieces of the Torah that totally disgust me. Um, the genocide of the Midianites. I mean, wow. Is there anything to learn? Yeah, I think there's something to learn. What is to learn is Never to think that we, the Jews, the Americans, the whoever's, that we're immune. No, the Torah reminds us we're not immune to the impulse, impulse to commit genocide. We're not immune. We've got to watch out for it. We've got to uh, yeah. take care not to get there. Uh, uh, so I don't want to dump it, even though, ee, yuck, disgusting. Uh, when I read it, right, the disgust is my midrash uh, on preserving it. Why to preserve it? So, so all right. So that's that's my way of of dealing with it. Yeah. Well, I want to express gratitude for the opportunity to learn with you. And, and I'm really excited that this won't be our last time that we're going to have an opportunity to learn with you twice more this year. And uh, so you should know, um, we're working with our local interfaith group, the Schenectady Clergy Against Hate, to do an Earth Day, a joint Earth Day mitzvah project. All, all of us, our whole Schenectady Clergy Against Hate, um, and we're, we're hoping that some of them will, will join uh, the next couple of, uh, your next couple of sessions in help, helping us to prepare for doing that together and grounding us in uh, the, this like moment of transformation and uh, in the ways that we can see ourselves in relationship to the earth and uh, and, and to the oneness that surrounds us all. And so, uh, you know, doing work, I, I, th I think it's going to be that we, we're going to do uh, some, a couple of, you know, outdoor physical projects of, of, of literally planting and cleaning garbage and, 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 and restoring a piece of the earth uh, in our in our local area, and uh, you know, in in the end of April, and your your sessions in January and March will help uh, to create fertile soil for that. And so th and so thank you, uh, and, and so thank you for 
helping to give us the why and not just not just so that we, so that we can do the actions but also so that we do the actions with the intentionality of of a deep of a deep why uh, so I, I think we've reached our our end time for this evening and I I want to thank everybody for, for coming and uh, Wait, and also before, uh, yeah before you actually uh, end yeah uh, let me draw on the traditional way of ending right so we had a short bracha for the beginning of the study and we have a longer one it's just like food you have uh just uh mostly at the beginning and then you have the longer uh, uh, uh bracha at the end so and in a jewish renewal way let me invoke uh kaddish to rabbanan if, if that's okay with you please okay so there are a couple of things about Kaddish to Rabbanon that really have moved me a lot. One was that for years, at the beginning, Kaddish to Rabbanon says, Shmei Rabbah. That's who we're addressing. Shmei Rabbah. What's that mean? The great name. What's your name? The great name. That's my name. What? That's even weirder than the Yudhei Bofei. The great name. What does that mean? And then... I visited for totally un different reasons. I visited the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C. And there are about 60,000 names. And they all become one great name. And it came to me, oh, the great name is that name in which are all the names of all the beings, past, present, future, all of them in the universe. Every galaxy and every quark, every rabbit, every frog, every redwood tree, every human being has its own identity, its own name. And they're all connected. They don't just all live in a little blob by themselves, but we're all that's what makes the great name that we're connected. And Kaddish to Rabbanon asks us to remember our teachers. So what I invite each of us to do is to remember a moment when we were taught. Might have been by a human being, might have been by a full moon, or the croak of a frog in a swamp, or a cloud of lightning bugs, uh, or a dog barking. It was something we learned from that moment. And to give that moment a name. So let me ask you to remember Remember, the opposite of dismember. Remember, put the pieces back together again of that moment and its name. Give it its name. Amen. Amen. And then, wait, there's more. <laughs> uh, and Karis Rabbanan says, um, and for our students and the students of our students. So I ask you to remember a moment when you were the teacher. And you might have been the teacher, the changer of a human being, or you might have been somebody who grew a plant in a garden, or you might have been somebody who cared for an animal or who cared for an idea. Uh, so remember the moment when you were the teacher. And give that moment a name. And weave those moments together. Into a piece of the great name. And now lift up your own name. 
and in the woven piece of the great name that you've already woven together, find exactly the right place to put your own name. And now take that whole small version of the great name and put it inside you. So you are in the great name and the great name is also at the heart of you. And as Kaddish to Rabbanan says, may there be blessings from our breathing together, words that aim toward wisdom. May there be the blessing of chesed, of loving kindness, as we listen to each other. May there be the blessing of shalom, of wholeness, as we begin to integrate what we have learned from each other. May there be the blessing of knowing that there is work to do in the world, work to make a livelihood for ourselves and for others, work that we can learn to do not on the back of earth or on the backs of other human beings, but as part of earth and as part of the human community. And the blessing of awakening to the time that we can pause from work, that we can pause to open our hearts to each other, that we can pause to dance, to sing, to tell stories, to listen to stories, to love, to make love. And the blessing of knowing that to the extent we can learn to share our breath as words with each other for the sake of healing the breath that's being choked by human mistakes. And to that extent, we can join the great breath of all life that is the Holy One. And for those blessings, we said together, beauty or not, we say, Amen. 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 Hmm. Yes, Shaka. Yes. Yes. Uh, Until we meet again. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Everybody. Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Rabbi Arthur, it's so good A to blessing. see you and to hear you. A blessing. A blessing yeah. to all. Blessing to Phyllis. And mm -hmm. you'll see you again. Thank you. In January. Let it throw. Let it throw. We will see each other again. Let it yeah. throw. Yes. Be well. Lila